Vector functions are made up of scalar functions. That means we can apply single variable calculus results to those individual scalar components. That allows us to generalize calculus to vector functions. We are going to talk about a limiting function. In terms of a definition, if we want to take the limit of a vector function, apply the limit operation to each one of these scalar components, in order for the limit of the vector function to exist, the individual scalar limits have to exist. And in this particular case, the individual limits will approach some sort of limiting result. There are some limit laws that we can make use of. Now, we're not going to prove any of these, but they are exactly as in single variable calculus. If there are two individual vector functions whose limits exist, you are able to do a lot of operations on combinations of these functions. So if these limits exist, then you get the following, that the limit of a sum of two vector functions or a difference of two vector functions is simply the sum or difference of limits. And this is just like it was with single variable calculus. It's a natural extension. Though I'm not proving it, it has to do with the fact that each individual component has a limit that exists and you can apply the limit laws to those individual components. The limit of a multiple of some vector function turns out to be a multiple of the limit of that vector function. So straightforward there. There are two types of vector product. You can have a dot product or a cross product. The limit of a product is the product of the limits. Now, all you have to make sure is that you're applying the correct product in each case. So that's the dot product version of it. Then the cross product version of it is identical, just replacing all dots with crosses. Now, again, none of these are being proved but it is straightforward to go ahead and prove them piggybacking off of the results you know for single variable calculus. There is no division limit law because division of vectors is not defined. The next concept is that one of continuity. If we ever have a vector function that satisfies this result, the vector function is continuous at t equals a. Here's your vector r of t, and then here's some location r of a. Now, regardless of whether you approach r of a from this side or from this side, you are moving closer to that location r of a, and there are no holes, no gaps, no jumps, no breaks. If you were to take the limit of each individual component of that vector function, it's going to simply equal to the value of those scalar functions at the point you're interested in. f of a, g of a, h of a. So no surprises there. The main one that we are interested in is differentiability. Differentiability has to do with calculating derivatives. And this is by far the most important result for us. So if we are talking about vector function that goes from R into R3, then R prime of T, this is the derivative of this vector function R. The limit as delta T goes to zero, R of T plus delta T subtract R of T over delta T. This will produce the derivative as long as this limit exists. Now, that's the same definition of the derivative as it always was. Remember that r of t traces out some curve. If I attach a coordinate system like this, here is the point r of t. Here is some other point r of t plus delta t. There's going to be a vector that connects the two of them, r of t plus delta t subtract r of t. As delta t gets 
smaller, this one vector is starting to move closer to that other vector. We are going to take a scalar multiple of this vector right here. So we are just scaling this entire vector. This vector starts to approach the tangent vector at t. This green one is what's called a secant vector. It's a vector that connects two points on the curve. This is going to be our tangent vector, r prime of t. As these blue dots start moving closer and closer together, the green vector starts looking more and more like the white vector. r prime of t is a vector tangent to the curve at the point given by r of t. We can define what's called the unit tangent vector. At a given point, t, we are going to define capital T as a vector. We are simply going to take the derivative function to get the tangent vector and then divide by r prime of t. So how do we actually compute the derivative function if we are given vector function for r of t. What we have to do is we have to assume each of these are differentiable. We will form that difference quotient like calc 1. We would then apply it as follows. Remember that we've got the limit of a vector function. So what we are going to be doing is forming that difference quotient for each component just like we normally would. And because of the limit laws that we discussed earlier, this limit exists. We are going to apply this limit to each one of the components that we have above. This just ends up being f prime of t, g prime of t, and h prime of t. So that's a very, very simple recipe to calculate the derivative of a vector function. Now, similarly, if you ever wanted the second derivative of a vector function, it would simply be the second derivative of each one of those components, assuming that the second derivative exists for all of those components. If I give you a curve, and it has a vector description of natural log ti, 2 root tj, and t squared k, what I would like to do is find the equation of the tangent line at the point 0, 2, and 1. So this should be a very familiar calculation to you, but what's going to change is the notation and the machinery that we're going to use. The equation of a tangent line, this vector function c of t, some point on the line plus t times a vector in the direction of the line. The direction of the line is given by the tangent vector. And that means we will need to compute this r prime of t, We've been told it's 0, 2, and 1. The derivative of each component applied to this function in vector form. The derivative of a natural log is 1 over t. The derivative here is going to be 2 times a half times 1 over the square root of t by the chain rule. And this is going to give me a 2t. The derivative is now this vector. Now remember, this is a vector that tells you which way the tangent is pointing in R3. It requires you to know a value of t. We need the value of t at the point 0, 2, and 1. And to do that, what we need to do is to be able to solve the individual components. x is equal to 0, y is equal to 2, z is equal to 1 for t. This is going to give me a system of equations. Natural log of t is 0, 2 root t is equal to 2, and t squared is equal to 1. 
If there is going to be a point on this line, that means the same value of t is going to have to satisfy all of these equations. The only one that works for all three of these is t is equal to 1. So the tangent vector is going to be r prime of 1. And just using the result that we had above, this would give us a 1, 1, and a 2. So the tangent line at this point is going to be 0, 2, 1, plus t into the vector 1, 1, and 2. There are also some differentiation rules that we can come up with. Now, we are not going to prove them, but they follow from the definition of the derivative and from the definition of all of the products and terms that we are using. We are going to assume that we have two differentiable vector functions, u and v. If that's the case, then we get the following. The derivative of a sum or difference of two vector functions is the sum or difference of the derivatives. Again, remember that we are assuming that these vector functions are differentiable, so their derivatives exist. The derivative of a multiple of a vector function is equal to a multiple of the derivative of a vector function. Now, I want to make something clear here. These terms in here produce a vector, so that means the object on the other side of the equation also has to be a vector. When you multiply a scalar with a vector, it ends up giving a vector, and that's the same thing that happens here. These are called linearity rules for differentiation of vector functions. There's a series of product rules for vector functions. The derivative of a scalar function times a vector function. This is a scalar. This is a vector. So the entire thing needs to be a vector. It's going to be f prime of t times the vector function u plus f of t times the derivative of that vector function. Scalar times vector produces a vector. Scalar times vector produces another vector. So this is the first product rule that we have. Well, there are other products that will happen when we have vector functions. So if we were to take the dot product, what's the derivative of a dot product? It's u prime of t dotted with v of t plus u of t dotted with v prime of t. And similarly, the derivative of a cross product of two differentiable vector functions, u prime of t crossed with v of t vector function plus u of t crossed with v prime of t vector function. This is a scalar. Well, that's a scalar, that's a scalar. We produce the right type of object, the cross product of two vectors, you get a vector, this is a vector, this is a vector, so we are producing the correct type of object. I will call these product rules. And finally, one of the most useful rules that we will have is a chain rule. The derivative of a vector with a scalar function on the inside, I will get the usual chain rule from calculus applied to this context. This is a vector function. This is a vector. This is a scalar. There is no quotient rule for the derivative of vector functions because division of vectors is not defined. We can go ahead and make some progress in terms of mechanically computing these. Take an example like the derivative of a vector function crossed with its derivative. So we are going to use our cross product rule. So the derivative of the first crossed with the second plus the first one crossed with the derivative of the second one. r prime of t crossed with r prime of t plus r of t crossed with r double prime of t. A vector crossed with itself is the zero. So at the end of the day, this is going to give us the following. If we assume that we have a vector function that is never zero for any t, let's determine the derivative of the magnitude. 
there is no rule for derivatives of lengths. The length is defined as the square root of the dot product of the vector with itself. That is the key observation. What that lets me do is compute the derivative of this quantity. And now I can use the chain rule and the dot product rule. I will have a 1 half times r dotted with r to the negative 1 half times the derivative of that inside quantity. This multiplication is not any sort of vector multiplication because these quantities r dot r are just scalar functions. r dotted with r downstairs in the square root, r prime of t dotted with r of t plus r of t dotted with r prime of t. The order of dot products doesn't matter. I will have a 2 r of t dotted with r prime of t. Those 2s will go away. r of t dotted with r prime of t over the length of this vector r of t. We can also use anti-differentiation and integration for vector functions. The antiderivative of a vector function, it's the antiderivative of each component. If each component is continuous, then you are assured to get some sort of antiderivative that exists. This would produce some new function plus a constant, some other new function plus some other constant, and a final new function plus some third constant, which you could then reorganize as f of t, g of t, h of t, plus this c1, c2, c3, which is then capital R of t vector function, plus some vector constant. Now, this is no different than the scalar version that we're used to. If you wanted to take the integral of a vector function, calculate the antiderivative, and then evaluate it from A to B. This would be the antiderivative function evaluated when T is B, subtract the antiderivative function evaluated when T is A, This would give you the net effect of saying integrate each individual component. So it becomes a very simple exercise in just applying what you've learned about single variable calculus to multivariable calculus. Let's find the integral if r of t cosine of pi t in the i direction, sine of pi t in the j, t in the k. So this curve represents a helix. The first thing that we need to do, compute the antiderivative function. That's going to be the antiderivative of cos pi t dt, antiderivative of sine pi t dt, antiderivative of t dt. You can use substitution. This will give you a 1 over pi sine of pi t plus some constant, negative 1 over pi cos pi t plus some other constant, t squared over 2 plus a third constant. So that's going to give me the antiderivative function, the integral of that. Take each one of those components and evaluate it from 0 to 1 negative 1 over pi cos pi t plus c2 from 0 to 1, and t squared over 2 plus c3 from 0 to 1. When you perform this valuation, you're going to get all of the c1, c2, c3 cancel each other out. You'll have 1 over pi sine of pi minus 1 over pi sine of 0, negative 1 over pi cosine of pi subtract negative 1 over pi cosine of 0, and in the third component you'll have 1 half subtract 0. The sine of pi is 0, the sine of 0 is 0. This gives me a negative 1, 
This gives me a positive one. So at the end of the day, I will have a zero, two over pi, and a one half.